before we get really in depth into XML, let's take a moment and look at what the difference is between XML and HTML, which I think will help us get a grip on what it is that XML actually does. As I said before, HTML stands for the Hypertext Markup Language, and XML stands for the Extensible Markup Language. And yes, I know Extensible doesn't start with the letter X. Um, what can I tell you? Uh, they're both called markup languages, but they do quite different things. Hypertext is text in a networked environment where the document itself contains links where the, there is a link between one document and another document. Basically, that describes pretty much every document on the entire web. The whole idea of hypertext is what makes the web a web, right? It's a web because it's got nodes, which are pages, and links between those nodes, which are hypertext links. The whole notion of hypertext is kind of deeply ingrained in our you know, consciousness these days because we're so used to dealing with hypertext documents that we don't really think about it anymore. But that's what hypertext is. So the hypertext markup language, HTML, is a markup language designed to enable you to create documents to display hypertext. XML, on the other hand, as I said before, is a markup language that defines rules for how to create structured documents. HTML documents are structured, but not very well, right? As I said before, XHTML is HTML written in XML. Lots of markup languages are written in XML. Uh, XML is capable of doing far more than just defining the tags in HTML. So let's look at some HTML right now. This web page here is the site for my school, the School of Information and Library Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. That's quite a mouthful. Um, this web page was created in Drupal. Uh, so no one wrote the HTML by hand. Um, as a CMS, Drupal does a lot of that for you, for the team who created this website. Um, so, you know, bear with the source code, which is not necessarily the most human readable. Let's blow that up a little bit so you can see that better. So what we have here, we've looked at this before. We have the header section which starts here and ends down the screen a ways, um, which is where some data gets put so that the browser knows where to find it, including, for example, meta tags. Right? What we have here is some meta tags about the school. Description and keywords and the content. HTML is the markup language used to write web pages such as this one. It tells browsers how to interpret the formatting of those web pages. It's not really a language. It's more just a set of commands, commands to the browser for governing how display happens. So for example, we have H3, information for. The header says information for. The information for header there corresponds to that H3 tag. We also have some hrefs. href is how in HTML you define a tag. A link is this text here, and that's the text that gets displayed on the page. We have br which is a page break in the uh, language of typewriters, if you remember those. It's a carriage return, etc. There are many other 
HTML tags. There's bold, there's italicized, there's other sizes of headers, et cetera, et cetera, right? HTML is metadata in the sense that it describes the formatting of the content of a page. Arguably, you could say that HTML is metadata about the formatting of the page, but it's not very useful as metadata in the sense that we mean it, which is why meta tags exist in the first place. HTML allows you to describe headers, the body of the document, section headers, you know, italics, bold, etc. all of these formatting elements, but it tells you very little about the structure of a document, which is, of course, what XML is for. XML does allow you to provide information about the structure of a document. It allows you to provide as much information about the structure of a document as you want. That's the whole point of XML. So let's look at an XML file here. So the Happy Monkey Recipe Collection. I did not write this. I have nothing to do with this site. I just found it and I like it because recipes are very well structured. So they make a nice example to illustrate XML. And I think the author of this site did a nice job of making the XML behind these recipes simple. So let's look at, for example, the Three Bears Instant Oatmeal recipe. This is the XML file for that recipe. And let's also take a look at the HTML version of that recipe side by side. Right, so what do we have here? We have a header section, we have the title of a section and a list of ingredients. Again, you have the header of a section and a set of narrative instructions, right? A nicely structured document, which contains some things that are lists like this and some the ingredients list is, of course, a list and some blocks of text. Right? So let's look at the XML version. Title, Three Bears Instant Oatmeal. Recipe information, which is this block right here. Recipe info start, recipe info end. Blurb, a quick and easy hot breakfast, etc. The description right here. Genre, breakfast food, file under, breakfast food, author, yield, 12 servings, you know, etc. Ingredient list, starts here and ends further down the page where we can't see it. Our first ingredient, have the start of an ingredient here, slash ingredient signals the end. Ingredient, food item, quick oats, Quantity, three units, cups. Three cups, quick oats. Another ingredient here, start of ingredient, end of ingredient. Food item, raisins. Quantity, one unit cup. One cup raisins. So what you've got is an ingredient list with a set of ingredients, but you've also got included in the section for each ingredient, you've got quantity, unit, and food item. So an ingredient list is not just the ingredients, but the quantity and the unit as well. So we have already built in quite a bit of structure. We have this list, but each item in the list has three pieces and we're able to specify what those pieces are uniquely. Now, imagine a search engine where you could say, well, gosh, I have pecans in my pantry. I would like a recipe with pecans in it. Lo and behold, you can actually do that. Right? I can go to Google and I've typed in here cookie recipe because, you know, I feel more like eating cookies right now than like eating oatmeal. So there you are. 
So I've gone to Google, I've typed in cookie recipe, and lo and behold, there is a recipes button, which Google was smart enough to put in there because I typed in the word recipe, of course. So I click the recipes button and Google gives me a list of things that it has identified as recipes. If I click search tools, I can even look at ingredients. If I want pecans, I can filter by only recipes that have pecans. If I want to, you know, filter out coconut, I can do that too. I can specify how long I want my cookies to take in the oven, calories, etc. The question you should be asking yourself at this point is, how does Google know all of this, right? All of the sites that are in this list that are where we're seeing recipes from, they are not, I should point out, using the Happy Monkey XML schema for recipes. They're using a different metadata schema that allows them to specify the same kind of data, recipes, cook time, you know, yield, etc. It's a different metadata schema, but one that specifies the same data about, excuse me, the same metadata about the recipe. We'll talk about what metadata schema that is in a future unit, but the point is Google is parsing that metadata out of the web pages that articulate these recipes. So HTML describes the formatting of a web page, which is arguably metadata about the formatting. Make this bold, make that italic, make a put a link here, put an image there, etc. But HTML says almost nothing about the content of the page itself. XML and other metadata schemas that we'll look at later that are based on XML do allow you to specify metadata about the content.